there's a tendency among most born-again Christians in our modern era to not prove all things and hold fast that which is good as the Thessalonians were commended to do and as we know that in the book of Acts we're told we should do and God says to us that we have no need that any man teach you but the Spirit of God that dwells within you he will lead you into all truth meaning that we should have the Spirit of God in us we should be able to sit down with the Bible and quite easily and honestly walk before God and talk with him and have an intimate relationship that he could show us what's true, what's accurate, what's according to the word of God, and what God wants to speak to us personally. We should be able to listen to and go to churches and enjoy what's personal opinion from a pastor and what's biblical scripture and what's exegesis and what's the learning curve for a pastor and what may be applicable to us and what doesn't fit for us according to the Spirit of God as he gives us ears to hear what the Spirit might say to us. Because each one of us, likewise, as God leads us and directs us, may be pointed in some slightly different direction in some minor ways, but still arrive at the same place and conclusion though God may have something to deal with us along the way, that maybe he doesn't have to deal with someone else. So he's kind of driving home a point, you know, that maybe someone else doesn't get. In the early days of the Christian movement, there were those that were claiming to be of Paul. Oh man, I follow Paul. I'm of Paul. And there were those that were claiming, oh no, I'm of Apollos. The disciples at Jesus' time had the same problem, you see. They wanted to say to Jesus, uh, Jesus, look, those disciples over there, John the Baptist, they're they're witnessing to people and they're they're getting people, you know, baptized more than we are, you know, and quite frankly, we're jealous. And Jesus said, look, no man can receive what they have gotten from, no man can do what they're doing except they have received it from my Father in heaven. So don't forbid them, but rather let them go. Because who is not against me is for me. And that's the point that sometimes we mistake when we see lots of ministries or lots of people doing things and somehow we don't, you know, like, let it alone and let it go because God is in control. Sometimes, even in our own personal choices of wanting to follow the Lord, we choose to follow men instead. Lately, I've seen this resurfacing of this whole idea again of this Chuck said mentality that I grew up with when I was in Calvary Chapel, you know, way back when. I wasn't there for the tent, but I was there for the building. <laughs> Who can figure? But I used to go seven days a week and see a lot of people come in, and they come into the tape lending library, and they'd talk, you know, and visit for a while, or they'd come into church, you know, and I'd be sitting around afterwards, either with the sound man, or setting up, or doing takedowns, or doing whatever it was, you know, cleaning up. And you'd hear a lot of things going on, that sometimes, you know, just like it used to be said by Romaine, you open the east door, and you open, or you open the north door, you open the south door, and the wind would blow through, and there went, you know, a whole bunch of people from Calvary Chapel starting some weird sect of Calvary because they just got caught up with some whim of doctrine, rather than following the Word of God and Jesus. Chuck said it interesting. Chuck in those days wasn't so worried about those things that were happening. He told us that, hey, you know, if the Lord's telling you to do something and He doesn't want you here, you go do it. We'll sit back and we'll watch and see what the fruit of it is. And if the fruit of the Spirit, you know, is there, then, you know, maybe we'll come ask you about it, you know, and want you to be involved. But, you know, we're not going to forbid you from going somewhere to go do what the Lord is telling you to do. And I love that about Chuck Smith because his direction was always about what the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit was telling you. How God by way of the Spirit of God in you was directing your life. And so, a lot of times, pastors learn that the easy way and the hard way. Some of them tried to be Chuck clones, and they were like Chuckites, and we used to have a little expression about it, you know, well, there goes another little Chuck, you know, and they were trying to be like Chuck, and most of them, when they tried to, just didn't pan out in the long run. They needed to be who they are in the Lord. And so you saw differences, like, you know, Greg, Greg isn't Chuck Smith. Greg is Greg, you know. That seemed to be pretty obvious pretty quickly. You know, Greg was a 
dynamic evangelist in the early days. Guess what? In his latter days, he's even more of a dynamic evangelist. There was John Corson, you know, who was trained up in the structure and the foundation of, you know, the church and kind of knew what needed to be done in order to organize things and get things going. And sure enough, John's still there, being John. John pretty in depth and pretty pretty anointed. You know, then there was Mike, you know, and, and Rawl and all these guys that were so dynamic in their own way that God inspired them as he led them. But they weren't Chuck clones. They weren't Chuckites. They loved Chuck. We all love Chuck. I mean, you're a Chuck, you're a Chuck, you're a Chuck, Chuck. But we all love Chuck because Chuck gave us the freedom to be who we are in the Lord. As long as we weren't, you know, so off the wall, you know, <laughs> that we somehow, you know, contradicted Scripture. And we don't. Because we have the Bible to agree on. And it's easy to agree on the Scriptures. Because God is the one who's in teaching us. And so, those that came from a certain, it seems like, perspective, seem to understand that and to know. Like when Chuck would come, you know, out and say, well, you know, the commentaries say this, and, you know, the theologians say this, but in my personal opinion, you know, and then he'll say, well, you know, Missler's been teaching this, but, I, you know, my opinion is this. And, you know, you'd listen and you'd go, yeah, you know, that makes sense. You know, and you'd agree with them about his personal opinion. But people sometimes forgot the difference between personal opinion and personal decision and personal choice. Because doctrines sometimes get attached to people just by things they say as opposed to what they said in the reality of their statements. And so a lot of times people take things and use them and run with them and don't go back and ask the person. or make something out of what was said more than what the content was. And lately I've been hearing that a lot, you know. Seems like, you know, people are getting all wrapped up into politics again, you know, and making this, oh, we've got to follow Chuck because Chuck's into politics right now, so we need to get on the bandwagon and follow after what he's doing. No, I don't. As a matter of fact, I don't need to get involved in what someone else is involved in I need to do what the Lord tells me to. You know, Tozer had an interesting issue. The same thing he saw coming in the charismatic movement, in the fundamentalist Christians, he spoke about and told all of us to be careful of. We could become so organized in our religion that we take away from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to inspire a person to go in the direction that they choose. People are telling me that the nation is going to fall apart unless we God knows we vote for a Mormon, or we vote for Mitt Romney, or we vote for this man or that man, or we don't vote for this man, or we don't vote for that man. And I'm thinking, the moral fiber of a nation is based upon the prayers of the people, not the elections of the general public as it stands. The reality of how we change a nation according to the scriptures is by the prayers of those that are offered up. Daniel prayed. Moses interceded for the people. The people were corrupt beyond belief. And Moses interceded on their behalf so they would not be destroyed. Abraham tried to do the same thing for Lot, but there weren't enough good people around. We, as Christians in this nation, have lots of people to pray. But we're choosing to do something a little bit different this time. And this is where the danger lies. People are trying to not pray first, but to do first, and ask God to sanction the action afterwards. There's a key issue there. God may not honor your decision by the fact that you're taking your authority in your own hands to do your will and not His will. What we do when we pray is to ask for His will to be done. I know that two people can go to God and pray and they can ask God the same question and get a different answer. because. God may want to show one something that he's not showing the other. Not because he's partial or that he's impartial, but that person may need to know something and grow in their developed relationship with God that he doesn't change the word of God. It's still the truth. But the way that it's applied to that person's life sometimes is tiny. You see, I would no sooner give someone a pastorship of a church unless God said to that doesn't know anything about the Bible, then I would 
someone who knows everything about the Bible. Because when God calls a man into the ministry, God calls that man into the ministry and chooses and uses them as he chooses and uses. But if he hasn't called, then except the Lord build a house, the man labors in vain. Why would he do it? Because he wants to? So he takes upon himself this mantle and fails miserably and leads people astray because he didn't know the Word of God or he knew too much of the Word of God and didn't know enough of the Spirit or that somehow we didn't let God be in control. That's the key issue sometimes about following men as opposed to following God. We have never, ever once portrayed the Jesus movement as Chuck said. I have never seen anyone anywhere at any point in time say because Calvary Chapel does it this way we have to do it this way. No, that's not true. If God is telling you to do something you should go do it. Always and everywhere no matter who you are or what you are in Calvary Chapels or in Ministry somewhere else, Assemblies of God, or in Foursquare, or in YWAM, or in Campus Crusade for Christ, or Jews for Jesus, or a missionary of any type. If you're saved, go do. Go do what the Lord tells you to do. Don't make yourself out to be Paul. Don't make yourself out to be Peter. Don't make yourself out to be Chuck Misler. Don't try to be Romaine. Don't try to be a Chuck Smith. Be you. Be who God made you to be. There are no Chuckites in heaven. There are people who may have patterned themselves after a similitude of who Chuck was serving, which is Jesus. But the good that you see in Chuck Smith is always Jesus Christ. That's always Jesus making himself known through Chuck. Remember that. Chuck's not anyone else except for a very tender man of God that God has used in a very acute and astute way to inspire us and inspire a generation to follow after the things he was sharing as though he had been in the presence of God. And that's why I honor, bless, and love Chuck Smith. Because whenever I see him or hear him or talk to him in any way, shape, or capacity, or form, I feel as though he'd been with the Lord. I feel as though he knows who I'm talking about. He's been the same place, or he's been beyond the place I've been, but I'm going there too, and that he's talk to the same God I'm talking to. He's relating to Jesus like I know Jesus. I feel like he's aware of who I know and that we have something in common. We have Jesus. And so I'm blessed by what Chuck says. But I would never, ever follow him only and not the Lord first. You see, I pray and then I do. Because Chuck told me that a long time ago. Chuck said I wouldn't even get out of bed. On one of his tapes, I'll admit, I wasn't at the service on that particular day. I might have been, who knows, maybe a different service. But on the service that was recorded that I made thousands of copies and passed them out to, you know, different people in the ministry at the Tate Lending Library and then Firefighters for Christ and other places, I remember the tape very well. Chuck said, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't even get out of bed and put on my pants before I talk to the Lord to give thanks. And it was a casual comment, but the reality made sense. Except you commit your day unto the Lord. What are you doing? What are you doing really? I think it's in the Holy Spirit series, by the way. Now that I think about it. Pretty sure. And if you aren't trusting in the Lord and committing unto Him your day, you're going on your own way. And Chuck mentioned about going like with the Lord, in the Lord, by committing it to the Lord. Commit your... Commit thyself unto the Lord, trust also in him, and shall bring it to pass. In the Psalm, I can't remember, 65. One of the Psalms. Commit, trust, rest, and obey. Basically, is what it boils down to. There's like five different anagrams that go through it, you know. And it, it shows kind of like, really, all you got to do is kind of like walk in the Spirit, really, and talk with God all through your day, and be with Him, and ask Him to lead you in different ways, and He will. You'll be inspired. You'll be doing the things he wants you to do when he wants you to do them. And that's the difference between someone taking out of context a perspective from a pastor or a pastor's perspective and trying to make it into a dogma. Chuck said it, so we do it. Well, there were times where Chuck would walk through, you know, maybe the 
chapel store and say, you know, well, lower that price or do that, you know. And I remember sometimes that happening, but, you know, for the most part, if it wasn't under direct authority of Calvary Coastal Mesa at the time, then what God was doing with John Corson, Chuck would not tell John Corson to do something different that John Corson was doing. John Corson would do what John Corson is going to do at Applegate Christian Fellowship as the Lord inspires him. As it so is, because the Spirit of God dwells within us and is incorporated through us, and we abide in his love and his peace, then God knits us together. So if Chuck suggested something to John, John would probably take it serious enough to pray about it and do it, if God told him to. And that's the difference between following men and agreeing with elders and deacons and pastors and those in authority. We can agree with them agree to pray, and if the Lord verifies or validates or tells us that that's what he wants us to do, then God may have spoken to the man, but we've gotten the evidentiary, the proof from the Lord. We have decided to walk according to peace with our brother in doing as the Lord says to do. For the way of peace in this latter days, a lot of people don't seem to understand or know. The strong pull towards church complexity for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Ephesians 5, 9 and 10. Many church groups have perished from too much organization, even as others have perished from too little. Wise church leaders will watch out for both extremes. A man may die as a result of having extremely low blood pressure, as certainly as from having too high a blood pressure, and it matters little which takes him off, he died. He is equally dead either way. The important thing in church organization is to discover the scriptural balance between two extremes and avoid both. It is painful to see a happy group of Christians born in simplicity and held together by the bonds of heavenly love slowly lose their simple character and begin to try to regulate every simple sweet impulse of the spirit and slowly die from within. One of the things Vidivo ministry has done, will done, and ever shall do is to tell you to follow Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We have found that in all our ways to acknowledge God, we have found in all our ways to trust in Him. We have found that in when we lean into our own understanding, we're choosing our understanding as opposed to his understanding and we're not being directed by the Spirit of God. So we choose Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to trust in the Lord with all our heart, to lean not our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and let him direct our path. And when we don't know, we don't go. We sit still and wait upon the Lord until he tells us. Because the Lord said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who bare not, but give it to all men liberally. The simplicity of the church organization is based upon the impulse of the Holy Spirit in a person's life as he hears and as he sees God doing in him what he wants God to reveal to him about Jesus. And as Jesus directs that person, that's the way a person should go. I can inspire you to follow me easily. That's charisma. But I choose not to. I choose to tell you in your world, in your life, in your day, in the situations that you're in. Take your Bible. Pray about it. Seek God. Seek out counsel. But in the long run, stand before the Lord Almighty and get a word from Him so that you can walk and talk and have fellowship with Him doing as He tells you to as opposed to what people tell you to do. Because there is no doubt no church will stand with you on the day of judgment. But you will. No one will stand by your side but Jesus, and he will. But you will also stand before Jesus to give an accounting for the life that you've lived, as well as the things you've done. And quite frankly, no church will be there. No pastor, no deacon, no elder, no Chuck, no Romaine, no anybody. But you. And you yourself know if you have talked to the Lord and prayed about what you did or didn't do. Now. The ease and simplicity of church organization is that. If God's telling you to do something, hey, I'm not going to stop you. If I pray about it and God says, no, 
I'm going to say, well, I'm going to let you go do it, but I'm not going to do it with you, <laughs> you know, because the Lord told me not to do it. It's kind of like right now, I see the country heading for really interesting times because they're fighting about who to choose to vote for, and God told me don't vote. Now, I haven't told anybody not to vote. I haven't told anybody to vote. Matter of fact, I tell everyone, look, if God tells you to vote, you vote. If God tells you not to vote, you don't vote. If God tells you to vote for a Mormon, hey, you go out and vote for a Mormon. If God tells you to vote for a nominal Christian, you go out and vote for a nominal Christian. If God tells you write in ballot, you write in the ballot. If God tells you you do something else, you go do something else. Me, I got a little more important things to do than to waste my time on politics. I have a political agenda. It is the kingdom of heaven on earth. I see the end of the world coming and I see this great generation of Jesus freaks Maybe don't think so soon the Lord is coming because sometimes they act like they're going to be around for the next 20 or 30 years. Can't help them. If that's what they want to do, go ahead. Your political agenda will change every four years. Me? I don't think so. As much as I love to see families want to spare their children, the agony of the Great Tribulation is coming. It's coming in that grandchildren's generation. It's coming in that children's generation. It's coming in my generation. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not standing around saying, well, I should be ready for the Lord, but even if he doesn't come back. Uh, that's a cop-out. He's coming back. And he's coming back soon. And he's coming back in my generation. Sorry. Bottom line. Scriptural. So, I'm not consumed by the political agendas. I'm consumed by my choice to follow the Lord as simply as possible, as accurately as He'll speak in my ear, and as obviously walking in His Spirit as He leads and directs me, as I expect you to do. By the simplest things all, all possible, pray first. If you pray, well, God, who do you want me to vote for, and you don't get an answer, then ask God, do you want me to vote? I started off with the simple answer, or the simple question. Well, God, show you what I'm going to do. I got a man on the left that they said, you know, they got together, they said, you know, we're not going to pick a Christian this time, we're not going to pick a politician, we're going to pick a Mormon, you know. I, we got him over here, you know, and then we got, you know, the man over here, you know, we got these two men, you know, and guess what, it's a flip of the coin. Which one do you want? No, I didn't do that. I said, God, do you want me to pray? Do you want me to put my support behind some man that hasn't represented me at all, doesn't represent any of my moral values, doesn't represent any of my Christian values. As a matter of fact, he doesn't represent anything about me. Either one of them. So do you want me to vote for him? And God said, no, of course not. I don't want you to vote for him. <laughs> I was like, cool. We're on the same page, Lord. <laughs> Did I make this up, Father? So I got a scripture on it, you know, I got a word on it, and I got, you know, Make your election and calling sure and that, you know, I'm not a citizen of this, you know, land or country, whatever, though I occupy the territory. I'm just passing through. I'm a sojourner, you know, citizen of the heavenly kingdom. You know, on and on. And Lord confirmed to me, made it no problem for my mindset to not vote. But I know that for some Christians, they find that, ooh, that's a problem. Except, I do pray. You see, I pray for the President of the United States right now. And I pray for the people that are in the United States of America right now. And I pray for those that are running for office right now. And you know what? I even pray for those that don't make it into office, and I still pray for those that have been in office. And you know what? I'll pray for whoever gets out of office as well as who goes into office. Because I think that's the simpler way. And then I could do like Tozer said, stay away from church complexity and stay away with the simplicity of the gospel and share it with everyone always and not divide and conquer like Christians are being divided and not conquering. It is painful to see a happy Christian born in the simplicity and held together by the bonds of heavenly love slowly lose their simple character and begin to try to regulate every simple impulse of the spirit and slowly die from within. Yet that is the direction almost all Christian denominations have taken throughout history and all Christian movements throughout history. And in spite of the warning set out by the Holy Spirit and the scriptures of truth, it is the direction of almost all church groups in and taking part today. All church groups are taking today. It is the direction almost all church groups are taking today. Let that be a warning. 
We're talking about Tozer. Now, I don't know too many people that say Tozer was wrong. Maybe he was. Tozer called himself a prophet. Okay, if he was a prophet, then he's either wrong or right. And quite frankly, I find that he's probably a, a prophet. And he was a prophet of the 20th century. He lived in my day. He would die just recently. It wasn't like far away, you know, years and centuries ago. No, he lived in our modern generation and he saw what was coming. And he speaks to us today and he warns us. Churches and societies founded by saintly men with courage, faith, and sanctified imagination appear unable to propagate themselves on the same spiritual level beyond one or two generations. In all our fallen life, there is a strong gravitational pull toward complexity and away from the simple things and simple and real relationship with Jesus. There seems to be a kind of sad inevitability back to our morbid urge towards spiritual suicide. From Tozer's own mouth to God's own ears, I can only say that what I see and what I fear seems to be applying to even my generation. The people that I know as Jesus freaks. The people that I know that come from Calvary chapels. Because, oh great, there's lots of them out there. Right on. Fantastic. But you see, I've kind of been around for a while. I've seen some of the good Calvaries. Fruit, ministry, growing, flowing. Some of it biting, some of it not. As any ministry would. Been around some of the ones that are also just waiting for the vacuum of church organization to be filled. You know, that what will happen when Chuck's gone. I've heard those words spoken by pastors. And I wondered, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. You really think that way? And I sat on it. And I've watched through the years how those pastors' ministries have floundered. They're still around. And I won't say their names because I pray for them constantly. I've seen other pastors that were Calvary chapels leave the ministry, fail, or I've seen them cover up ministry, fail, or errors, or even, dare I say, apostate teachings at times. Oh, God busted them, and God changed them, and God rearranged them, and I praise the Lord for the faithfulness of men that have prayed and restored even pastors to their proper place, even as Chuck has with some ministers who have fallen. But likewise, in every ministry and in every place, pastors are men, and they make mistakes. Children are children, men are men. The difference between a man and a child is a child will try to hide always behind their parents or blame someone else. But what a man of God does, he stands up and admits before the congregation and before the people, before God Almighty, that he blew it, he failed. He made a mistake. He was an error. He was wrong. And he gives accounting to God for his actions. Will you be a man of God and a woman of God when you make your decisions to do whatever it is you're doing in life, with your marriage, with your relationships, with your country, with your voting, with your service to your country, with your service to your Lord, with your service to God? And will you say that you were God-directed, or did you just try to be like Chuck said? Because, quite frankly, if you ever came to Chuck <laughs> in his younger days, and you told him Chuck said, I don't think Chuck would be appreciate you as much as you think he might. Because Chuck did have a little bit of a temper, you know, at times, like most of us do. And I don't think you could have came up and said, Chuck said to him, you know, and used something out of context. Chuck would not have appreciated it because I remember there was a radio station, KYMS, that used to have somebody on the radio after Chuck, you know, on Sunday nights, that sometimes even mentioned Chuck said. And it was not a good time <laughs> in some places that I heard about. <laughs> Well, praise the Lord, it all worked out in the long run. <laughs> because God has a way of healing anything that happens in the body of Christ. But our learning from this message, from Tozer, and from the Spirit of God in us, is that we don't follow Chuck Smith, we don't follow Romaine, we don't follow Calvary Chapels, we don't follow 
Assemblies of Gods, John MacArthur, Greg Laurie, John Corsons, uh, Josh McDowell's, Hal Lindsay's, um, <laughs> Catholic Church, Protestant Church, you know, all the denominations, Greek Orthodox, whatever. We follow Jesus. We follow as the Spirit of God leads us and directs us and guides us to a place we may learn from and incorporate the wisdom that men give us from the pulpit, as Chuck does and all these other denominations and churches and people that have gone before us do in the hallmark of faith that we have, that even Hebrews lists all those that, though men they were failures, they also, as men of God, were successes by way of faith that they demonstrated what they had when God inspired them to do what it was that he wanted them to do in the first place. And they did it. And so they were inspirations to us, not by their entire life, but by what God recorded as their life. And that's what God will do with us. He will use those moments that we were obedient to Him as the highlight of our life. Because if you're doing things without asking Him, if you're doing actions not led by the Spirit of God, if you're making choices and you haven't prayed about it, you haven't talked to God about it because you thought it was automatic, that of course you're making a decision based upon a moral principle, of course, your mores are so offended that, you know, oh, God forbid that God could say anything else except for what you want to hear. I don't know about you. I only know for me the decision I made, and that was to pray. Because I asked God, Lord, what do you want me to do? I will do anything you say, even taking up my cross and dying on it. I will follow you to the day I die. And I will be with you in eternity. So, Lord, you tell me what you want me to do, and I will do it. So, God, show me the way. Teach me in your way. Allow me to be, even as Tozer says today, a man after God's own heart, to do his will and not my own. Is that what you want? Do you want to do someone else's will? Or do you want to do God's will be done? Thank you.